So chapter five is titled, Who is the Dark-Haired One? And the vocabulary word for this chapter is Emparis, which is assuming power or to be arrogant. Do you really think anyone will come? Ellen asked nervously, turning to Anne Marie in the bedroom. Your father doesn't think so. Of course not. They're always threatening new stuff. They just have to, they just like to scare people. Anne Marie took her nightgown from the hook in the closet. Anyway, if they did, it would give me a chance to practice acting. I used to pretend to be Lise. I wish I were taller, though. Ellen stood on her tiptoes trying to make herself tall. She laughed at herself, and her voice was more relaxed. You were great as the dark queen in the school play last year. You should be an actress when you grow up. My father wants me to be a teacher. He wants everyone to be a teacher like him, but maybe I could convince him that I could go to acting school. Ellen stood on tiptoe again and made an embarrassed gesture without, with her arm. I am the Dark Queen, she said in intoned dramatically. I have come to command the night. You should try saying, I am Lise Johansson, Anne Marie said, grinning. If you told the Nazis that you were the Dark Queen, they'd haul you off to a mental mental institute. Ellen dropped her actress pose and sat down, with her legs curled under her on the bed. They won't really come here. Do you think? She asked again. Anne-Marie shook her head. Not in a million years. She picked up her toothbrush. The girls found themselves whispering as they got ready for bed. There was no need, really, to whisper. They were, after all, supposed to be normal sisters. And Papa has said they could giggle and talk. The bedroom door was closed. But that night did seem somehow different from a normal night. And so they whispered. How did your sister die, Anne-Marie? Ellen asked suddenly. I remember when it happened, and I remember the funeral. It was the only time I'd ever been in a cathedral church. I'm sorry, in a Lutheran church. But I never knew just what happened. I don't know exactly, Anne-Marie confessed. She and Peter were out somewhere together, and then there was a telephone call. That there had been an accident. Mama and Papa rushed to the hospital, remember? Your mother came and stayed with me and Kirsty. Kirsty was already asleep, and she slept right through the whole thing. She was so little then. But I stayed up. I was with your mother in the living room when my parents came home in the middle of the night, and they told me Lise had died. I remember it was raining, Ellen said sadly. It was still raining the next morning when Mama told me. Mama was crying, and the rain made it seem as if the whole world was crying. Anne-Marie finished brushing her long hair and handed her hairbrush to her best friend. Ellen undid her braids, lifted her dark hair away from the thin golden chain she wore around her neck. Her chain held the Star of David and began to brush her thick curls. And this is a picture of the Star of David. I think it was partly because of the rain. They said she was hit by a car. I suppose the streets were slippery, and it was getting dark, and maybe the driver just couldn't see. Anne Marie went on remembering. Papa looked angry. He made one hand into a fist and kept pounding it on the other hand. I remember the noise of it. Slam, slam, slam. Together they got into a wide bed and pulled up the covers. Anne Marie blew out the candle and dart and drew the dark curtains aside so that the open window near the bed would let in some air. See the blue trunk in the corner, she said, pointing through the darkness. Lots of Lisa's things are in there, even her wedding dress. Mama and Papa have never looked at those things, not since the day she, they packed them away. Ellen sighed. She would have looked so beautiful in her wedding dress. She had such a pretty smile. I used to pretend that she was my sister, too. She would have liked that, Anne-Marie told her. She loved you. 
That's the worst thing in the world, Ellen whispered. To be dead so young. I wouldn't want the Germans to take my family away, to make us live someplace else. But still, it wouldn't be as bad as being dead. Anne-Marie leaned over and hugged her. They won't take you away, she said. Not your parents, either. Papa promised they were safe, and he always keeps his promises, and you are quite safe here with us. For a while they continued to murmur in the dark, but their murmurs were interrupted by yawns. Then Ellen's voice stopped and turned over. In a minute her breathing was quiet and slow. Anne-Marie stared out the window, where the sky was outlined, and a tree branch moved slightly in the breeze. Everything seemed very familiar, very comforting. Dangers were no more than odd images, like ghost stories the children made up to frighten one another. Things that couldn't possibly happen. Anne-Marie felt completely safe here in her own home, with her parents in the next room, and her best friend asleep beside her. She yawned contently and closed her eyes. It was hours later but still dark, when she awakened abruptly by a pounding on the apartment door. Anne-Marie eased the bedroom door open quietly, only a crack, and peeked out. Behind her, Ellen was sitting up, her eyes wide. She could see Mama and Papa in their nightclothes moving around. Mama held a lighted candle, but as Anne-Marie watched, she went to the lamp to switch it on. It was so long a time since they had dared to use the strictly rationed electricity after dark that the light in the room seemed, seemed startling to Anne-Marie. She saw her mother automatically, look automatically to the blackout curtains, making certain that they were tightly drawn. Papa opened the front door to the soldiers. This is the Johansson apartment? A deep voice asked the question loudly, in a terrible accent Danish. "'Our name is on the door, and I see you have a flashlight,' Papa answered. "'What do you want? Is something wrong?' "'I understand you are a friend of your neighbors, the Ro Rosins,' the soldier said angrily. "'Sophie Rosin is my friend, that is true,' Mama said quietly. "'Please, could you speak more softly?' My children are asleep. Then you will be so kind as to tell me where the Rosins are. He made no effort to lower his voice. I assume they are at home sleeping. It is four in the morning, after all, Mama said. Anne-Marie heard the soldier stalk across the living room toward the kitchen. From her hiding place in the narrow sliver of the open doorway, she could see the heavy uniformed man, a holstered pistol at his waist, in the entrance to the kitchen, peering in toward the sink. Another German voice said, The Rosins' apartment is empty. We are wondering if they might be visiting their good friends, the Johansons. Well, said Papa, moving silently so that he was standing in front of Anne-Marie's door, and she could see nothing except a dark blur of his back. As you see, you are mistaken. There is no one here but my family. You will not object if we look around? The voice was harsh. And it was not a question. It seems we have no choice, Papa replied. Please don't wake my children, Mama requested again. There is no need to frighten little ones. The heavy booted foot moved across the floor again and into the other bedroom. The closet door opened and closed with a bang. Anne-Marie eased her bedroom door closed silently. She stumbled through the darkness to bed. Ellen, she whispered urgently, take your necklace off. Ellen's hands flew to her neck. Desperately, she began trying to unhook the teeny clasp. Outside the bedroom door, the harsh voices and heavy footsteps continued. I'm going to pause here for a moment. I want you to think about the question and jot in your journal. Why is it important that Ellen remove her necklace?
I can't get it open, Ellen said frantically. I never take it off. I can't even remember how to open it. Anne Marie heard a voice just outside the door. What's in here? Shh, her mother replied. My daughter's bedroom. They are sound asleep. Hold still, Anne Marie commanded. This will hurt. She grabbed the little gold chain and yanked with all her strength and broke it. As the door opened and light flooded into the room, she crumpled it into her hand and closed her fingers tightly. Terrified, both girls looked up at the three Nazi officers who had entered the room. One of the men aimed a flashlight around the bedroom. He went to the closet and looked inside. Then he swept. Then, with a sweep of his gloved hand, he pushed the floor. Sorry, he pushed to the floor several coats and a bathrobe that hung on the pegs of the wall. There was nothing else in the room except a chest of drawers, the blue decorated trunk in the corner, and a heap of Kirstie's dolls piled in a small rocking chair. The flashlight beam touched each item. Angrily, the officer turned toward the bed. Get up, he ordered. Get out here. Trembling, the two girls rose from the bed and followed him. Brushing past the remaining officers, in the doorway to the living room. Anne Marie looked around. These three uniformed men were different from the ones on the street corners. The street corner soldiers were often young, sometimes ill at ease, and Anne Marie remembered how the giraffe had, for a moment, let his harsh poise slip and he smiled at Kirsty. But these men were older, their faces set with anger. Her parents standing beside each other, their faces tense, but Kirsty was nowhere in sight. Thank goodness that Kirsty slept through almost anything. If they had wakened her, she would be wailing, or worse, she would be angry, and her fists would fly. Your names? the officer barked. Anne Marie Johansen. And this is my sister. Quiet. Let her speak for herself. Your name? He was glaring at Ellen. Ellen swallowed. Lise, she said and cleared her throat. Lise Johansen? The officer stared at them grimly. Now, Mama said in a strong voice, you have seen that we are not hiding anything. May my children go back to bed? The officer ignored her. Suddenly he grabbed a handful of Ellen's hair. Ellen winced. He laughed scornfully. You have a blonde child sleeping in the other room, and you have this blonde daughter, he gestured toward Anne Marie with his hand. Where did you get the dark-haired one? He twisted the lock of Ellen's hair. From a different father? From the milkman? Papa stepped forward. Don't speak to my wife in such a way. Let go of my daughter, or I will report you for such treatment. Or maybe you got her someplace else, the officer continued with a sneer. From the Rosins? For a moment, no one spoke. Then Anne Marie, watching in panic, saw her father move swiftly to the small bookcase and take out a book. She saw that he was holding the family photograph album. Very quickly, he searched through the pages, found what he was looking for and tore out three pictures from three separate pages. He handed them to the German soldier, who released Ellen's hair. You will see each of my daughters, each with her name written on the photograph, Papa said. Anne Marie knew instantly which photographs he had chosen. The album had many snapshots, all the poorly focused pictures of school events and birthday parties but it also contained a portrait taken by a photographer of each girl as a tiny infant. Mama had written in her delicate handwriting the name of each baby daughter across the bottom of those photographs. She realized, too, with an icy feeling, why Papa had torn them from the book. At the bottom of each page, below the photograph itself, was written the date 
and the real Lise Johansen had been born twenty-one years earlier. Kirsten Elizabeth, the officer read, looking at, Kirst at, looking at Kirsty's baby picture. He let the photograph fall to the floor. Anne-Marie, he read next, glanced at her and dropped the second photograph. Lise Margaret, he read finally, and stared at Ellen for a long time, unwavering moment. In her mind, Anne-Marie pictured the photograph that he held. The baby, wide-eyed, propped against a pillow, with her teeny hands holding a silver teething ring, her bare feet visible below the hem of an embroidered dress. The wispy curls. Dark. The officer tore the photograph in half and dropped it to pieces on the floor. Then he turned, the heels of his shiny boots grinding into the pictures, and left the apartment. Without a word, the other two officers followed. Papa stepped forward and closed the door behind them. Anne-Marie relaxed the clenched fingers of her hand. I'm sorry. Anne-Marie relaxed the clenched fingers of her right hand, which still clutched Ellen's necklace. She looked down and saw it had imprinted the Star of David on her palm. And that is the end of chapter five. So your end of the chapter question is whom does Ellen pretend to be when the soldiers come to the Johansons? And why does she pretend to be this person? Okay, so you're going to answer these two questions in your reading journal.